this is sort of a maybe a mental model of how to think about our place in the universe. When you look at the night sky, if a star is one million light years away, when it hits us now, we're looking one million years back in time. That star mm -hmm. could be gone. Mm -hmm. It could be a whole change thing, and you wouldn't know for one million years. Oh yeah. And so if you if you sort of think on that scale that at any given time we are actually seeing history. Yep. Every night when you look up at the night sky, you mm -hmm. are seeing mm -hmm. the past. Oh, dude. it's really possible even analytically to say, hey, look, it might have all already happened and we're just experiencing yes. it. Yes. And so it's a sort of idea that gives me comfort in an odd way because it says, hey, look, if you don't, you can't really impact that much outside yourself. You're given these tools that if you pay attention to them, your brain, your heart and your soul, they'll guide you. What's up, man? How are you doing, sir? Great to see you, buddy. I really appreciate getting to know you. Great to see you. Last year better. Same, same to you. And um, and okay, so let's just start with the the. Let's just dive right into the deep end. Um, <laughs> is mankind going to be replaced by artificial intelligence? Well, I'd say step one is what's the trajectory of mankind, and if you look at the history of the planet. Um, uh, on that, uh, unfortunately, I, I think we don't have the best lookout. And I think one of the things that Elon Musk said that really struck me, I was wondering why are all these guys apart from ego focused on space travel? And Elon Musk said, basically I'm focused on space travel because if mankind is, or humankind is just stuck on one planet over some time series, the eventual outcome is bad. Uh, whether you're a dinosaur or, you know, we're on the fifth extinction, they say. So um, I think step one is to recognize that probably from a probabilistic perspective, um, you know, there's a number of threats, some self-induced uh, that are challenging us as humankind. So uh, once you accept that, the second thing I'd say is the wonderful thing about humans and particularly America. I'm an immigrant to America and what brought me here. We can debate where we are in America today, but is the wonderful history of innovation and creativity and our ability to respond to circumstance and come up with just incredible things. I'll even say like, you know, the I'm shocked as mm -hmm. I think the Europeans are shocked at how quickly within a matter of weeks they changed decades uh, or more of foreign policy. And so the second point would be, while the outlook is grim, my faith in humanity and historic, you know, looking at the history of humanity is high. Artificial intelligence is an interesting thing. I think one of the ways, um, I think it was either uh, uh, Chris Dixon or Naval Ravikant referred to uh, crypto and the blockchain and Ethereum is computers can now make decisions. And so artificial intelligence is one segment of that. But you already have, if you look at DeFi and some of the things you and I have discussed around the blockchain, and you already have computers performing a variety of tasks in, you know, in automation, in sorting, in all kinds of areas. I don't uh, pretend to be an AI expert in any way. And, um, I can't probably speak to the risk of a AI takeover as much as I think all systems uh, are complex and from simple rules, you can get very complex outcomes. I worked for a guy, Michael Mobison, over 20 years ago and then TA'd for him in business school. And he had me read a book called Complexity. It was wonderful and thought, so thought provoking at the time. It was you know, the Santa Fe Institute um, is a was created to study complexity. And the point of what he said is, look, you can actually get very complex outcomes from super simple rules. Um, like you can get the formation and patterns of geese by having like three or four rules, and then you get all these complex behaviors. So what I'd say is, I certainly listening to people smarter than myself on AI, it's very clear there are risks. And we've all seen the movies and so on that 
you give AI like brains, you know, they'll just take out humanity because we're our own biggest threat. But uh, I'd say I put it all together to say, I'm, you know, I'm like an optimistic nihilist is what I like to say is. Uh, <laughs> Stephen uh, Kawaja, welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, is that, look, I think um, every tool can be used. There's no sort of good or bad. We impart values on stuff. There just is. And every tool can be used in different ways. And I hope that we find ways to use AI as the powerful tool it is to help us move humanity forward. That's exactly right. And I think that uh, the tools are relatively neutral. And at some point, they might become sentient and might then develop their own wants, right? They're neutral until they develop, they're neutral as long as they don't have their own desires. But once they start to have their own desires, then the tools, you know, are using themselves. Well, I've looked a lot into machine learning because I had all these ideas in my former company about how to apply machine learning to like the formulation of, you know, at the time paint, which was what I was looking at. You've seen machine learning be applied to pharmaceuticals and to the discovery of new types of materials. And already the outcomes are simply incredible. I think where machines have superiority over humans is we're terrible at handling data, big data sets. We have all these complex heuristic biases, uh, which, you know, are enormous and really impact how we see data. And so to me, the first promise is sort of an objective look at mass quantities of data, which is already happening. And I found whenever I've examined data, or use tools to examine data. I'm always, even if I thought I knew about something, I'm always pleasantly surprised. So yeah, uh, I think, look, I hope, you know, who knows where it'll all go. And I think right now the risks to humans are, are mostly from humans rather than, but that could change over time. So. Yeah. I mean, and I want to, I mean, the last thing I'll say, I want to, I want to kind of like circle back to give some context for you and your, your career trajectory and your journey, because you're a really interesting dude. Uh, I would say the last thing I'll say on that is, I think you're right. Yeah, like we don't know where it's going to go, and we might be at that. I don't know if you've ever watched um, Mishu Kaku. He's a, a um, research physicist who has theories on basically human evolution and whether we're going to either come up to this uh, this this organic event where we're either going to uh, he calls it like the like this uh, was the, the net of humanity, where we either uh, get caught by the net and we either you know don't make it past this stage, or we either we we either make we make it through basically the barrier and we're able to pass through whatever the barriers are to us expanding civilization, whether it's technological, you know, uh, growth capacity, you know, um, just wars, famines, just there's this there's this uh, this plateau that civilizations hit. And he says, we're, we're either past that, pl that plateau already, we, had, we don't know it, or we're about to run into it. And he calls it the net. I think most it's things, what I learned, I learned this when I first started, and it was the internet bubble. And it was 1990, I started in 98. In 1999, everyone's like, oh, so-and-so is the smartest person ever. Then three years later, when they'd crash, they'd retell history and say, oh, that person's the dumbest person ever. Right. So right. I think right. human right. beings have a tendency to interpret all past events based on their present understanding of someone or something. And so my answer, even on my own life, I would say, we won't know till the end how, if that was right yeah. or wrong or good or bad, or yeah. if you sort of just how it feels now or what you think now is really, you know, look back at your own life and history on how people thought about something. And then 20 years later, it might've turned out what was terrible and painful and miserable was actually the best thing that could have happened. And so I, I think about that a lot with my own um, just my own retelling of my own history. I retell stuff in my own head differently than it happened. And I have to catch myself because sometimes I'll have a filter where it's like, oh, I remember something as being more pleasant than it really was in that time. You think you look back on something, and you're like, you're like, oh, that was so that was so fun. I really miss this time. But when you were in that time, you're like, man, fuck this. This sucks. And there's that historical retelling that, you know, when you see something and play back. It's not the same as when it occurred. Well, Daniel, I used to think facts were the most important thing. Um, and that if you showed people the facts, 
that it would be obvious. What I've learned is the narrative is the most important thing. Whether you're a company yep. or a person, people can take any fact and fit it to a narrative. And the most important narrative to each person is their narrative to themselves about themselves and their life. It can cause people to do the most wonderful things or the most atrocious things. And um, a powerful narrative. And, you know, there's many books. And the one that first moved me on this was uh, a book called Influenced by a guy, Robert Cialdini, I read in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he basically boiled down. He was like a psychologist, and then he did all these jobs that required people like back at the time selling encyclopedia or cut coat knives or whatever it was. And he boiled down into six principles, the things that allow humans to influence other humans. There was another book that I think, a Virus of the Mind, written by a Microsoft guy that talked about the inherent attractiveness of certain ideas. And we see this every day. We see why false news or you know, I remember people will share statistics and I'm a real nerd. Whenever anyone tells me anything, I go look it up to see like, is, you know, could, is it quotes true or not? Or do the facts support it? And they're just, you know, certain elements to narratives that make them more believable or attractive to human beings. And so I think you're right. My constant, the joy of this though, and the upside is that at any time, you can change your own narrative and your ability to change as a human is tremendous. Think about when you're feeling down and you're sitting there and you're, oh, I work, yep. it's overwhelming oh, yeah. and this and that. And you sit oh, yeah. back and you come up with a plan or you're like, you know, you have some gratitude or you get some new perspective. And in a matter of minutes, your entire chemistry and outlook can change. And so I think oh, yeah. the idea that facts determine things is it was I was shocked is not correct. The a powerful narrative is the most impactful. Whether you're a company and you're think about the most successful companies in the world, they have a clear mission and narrative about what they do. The most people I know who are successful, their narrative about themselves and what they do is is really critical to that. So I think. Um, and like you said, we all retell history. In fact, on the negative side, look, I see it right now. If you look at what Putin has done, he did what another atrocious figure in history did, which is constantly start when you're telling a story. What Hitler did was retell. Yeah, you can say. I mean, you can say it. It looks. It looks. What what Putin is doing in Russia, and I, you know, I or what Putin is doing in Ukraine, and I I know a limited amount just from observing maybe maybe a few hours of total coverage it looks a lot like the start of world war ii he's re he's looking back and who knows what's true or not but the the sort of history of russia and the and and the ukraine and the boundaries and so i just think like you know one of the strongest things is um telling a narrative and what i've learned about communities is if you look at any community pardon me i'm going to just turn this off for one second if you look at if you look at any community or profession, what I've learned is actually language becomes one of the defining things. I think we joked when I was down there, but if you go into the doctor and you're like, hey, doc, I somebody hit me and it hurts, as opposed to, hey, doc, doctor, I took blunt trauma to my quadriceps. I have a hematoma with some associated neuropathy or whatever the right word is. All of a sudden you sound like a totally different person. And, and this happened to me. Unfortunately, I've had to deal with a fair amount of legal stuff, which is part of being in business and unfortunately getting divorced. But I remember talking to a lawyer once and I was explaining a case and the lawyer said to me, oh, where'd you study law? And it was a function of the fact that I'd used language and concepts and presentation <laughs> that a lawyer would use. And so I think this is generally a broader issue, which is like, you know, the words you use, the specific words can be used to build community, to be, to build excitement, to build passion. They can also be used, unfortunately, to build negative things. So the narrative you say about yourself is the most important narrative. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. 
It's so yeah. true. It's so true. It's um, allowed me to change over the last decade. I, I think we were talking. In 2011, I looked up and I had a narrative that had been the result of, you know, me listening to what I thought I was supposed to do. I've heard the expression, shit aside, don't commit shit aside. You know, I should do this. I should want that. And I found myself in that position (laughs) where I. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll back it up, back it up. Yeah. Well, we'll give some, but give it, give some context for how you got there because I, you know, we launched into this because I wanted to show people this guy has so many incredible things <laughs> packed into one. You can just ask him one question and he's going to, and, and let's back it up. Who is Stephen Kawaja? Um, that's a funny question. I can tell you a little bit about that. This is a great <laughs> story. Uh, I, <laughs> We're 15 yeah, minutes in, uh, but it's okay. I was born in, born in Montreal, Canada, raised in Toronto. My parents are from the West Indies, a little island called St. Kitts. So they're Caribbean. Um, my mother's English background, my dad Lebanese, but both born and raised in the West Indies. I grew up spending most of my youth, every vacation going to St. Kitts and various other Caribbean islands. Um, I came to the U.S. for college. I went to Duke, studied economics and philosophy, moved to New York to work in finance. I did a CFA um, which is like a chartered financial analyst, a three-year kind of out-of-school finance program. Um, and I did uh, stock research at a couple banks. Then I did an MBA at Columbia. After that, I worked doing um, what, what they call the buy side, working in doing investing and at a hedge fund. And eventually was a hedge fund manager working for a guy named Steve Cohen, who they made the show Billions after. Um, after... I t- it was yeah. 2008. Uh, I was the last man standing quite literally in the company in my office in San Francisco. And I decided to take a different route. And my, I was lucky enough, my father, who has a PhD in finance, uh, who had started some companies in 1972. Um, I joined that company, the group of companies, and I ran for three years. I did a turnaround of a business in Canada that sold adhesives, which is a fancy word for glue. And then for the last 10 years through the end of last year, I ran our two companies uh, or helped run two companies. One was in a uh, industry called refractories, which are high temperature resistant materials used in steel mills and high heat situations. The other, which was the bulk of my time was building a powder coatings manufacturing business. So that's a paint company like uh, we compete Competed with Sherwin Williams, Sherwin Williams, PPG or AXO, people like that. Um, I'm twice divorced. I have four kids with 50% custody. I'm into tattoos. Is that that's like having two kids? I'm into, I have a lot of random hobbies. I brew beer. I have chickens. I have bees. I garden. I do yoga. (laughs) I like to rap. Um, I like sneakers. I like NFTs cryptocurrency ladies hit him up in the dms <laughs> hit him up. so um who am i is actually that's an interesting question so i think all of us um have ideas about ourselves so uh, you know in 2011 i remember looking up i was married three kids or i think uh one on the way two kids one on the way and i had what i thought it everything i'd ever dreamed of a great job a lovely wife and children and, you know, living in California, having come from Canada and I didn't feel happy, you know, uh, I wasn't happy. Uh, so I spent basically the last 10 years figuring out, you know, who's Stephen Kawaja. Um, and so it wasn't, I always joke with people and say, if you'd handed me the list of what I had to go through prospectively to get happy, I would have said, <laughs> F that. No, thank you. Nope. Having said that, um, we don't choose our path in a way. I think we all think we have much more control. We barely control ourselves, let alone, you know, there's 8 billion plus people in the world. We're one planet out of hundreds of billions in the galaxy. And there's hundreds of billions of galaxies. So, that's why I was joking as an optimistic nihilist. Like I accept I'm nothing if I, at best I have impact on a small group of people 
And that should be freeing. It was freeing for me to say, hey, I'm just going to do my best and pursue all these things that I love and try to be my best at them. And so I think um, when I think about who I am, uh, you know, look, everyone likes, I'm, of course, proud of my children and proud of my accomplishments. But I think I maybe haven't put the right words to it, but honestly, the way I think about who I want to be is I think I'm one tiny, tiny bit of this greater universe. And I'm trying to use my soul to figure out how I can give back and play my role in this greater picture. And that's really what drives me. Yeah. I think about that a lot. I think about, <clears throat> in fact, just on, on the podcast, just that was re released today with Dr. Brett Jones, he said something similar. He said something to the effect of you exist to fill a universal need. You exist to fill that the, the exact designed receptacle puzzle slot piece in the universe where you're going to contribute a unique idea, skill, uh, creation, contribution. And that is what was essential for this time in, you know, the evolution of the species and, you know, henceforth. Yeah, I think, <laughs> so I had this odd experience. I, I, I think like, you know, I'm almost 47 and I grew up in a generation where at the time, Oh no, 47. Time, well, so. no, I just think, um, you know, it's much more acceptable now just being honest as a man to talk about your feelings. And when I was For sure. Kid, Mental health yeah, at all. I know. I mean, <laughs> when I was a kid as a boy, you know, talking about your feelings, your feelings weren't no criticism of that what was feelings? Cool. exactly your feelings don't matter boys don't cry be a man and so i think you know still a lot are yeah. told that and so i think i i you was like what i like to say is we have three dials to interact with the unit the world brain heart and soul i was at 10 on brain zero on emotions and zero on soul at the start of my journey and the first step for me was like even putting words to my emotions. It was hard for me to even say, like, I know that sounds stupid, but like, how do I feel? No. And once I'd sort of battled through learning how to communicate about emotions, the next was understanding soul, which in a non-religious context to me is like, what's your place in the universe? And what I found is actually, look, emotions, words, Logic is words, emotions are feelings, you know, like it sends you. Your soul is a sense of right or wrong or belonging or not. And I didn't listen to it a lot of the time and I push it down. I do think the soul is the thing yep. that tells you, are you doing what it is you're here to do? And I've had a kind of, I have a kind of, if you'll allow me, I don't, this is sort of a, maybe a mental model of, how to think about our place in the universe. I've, I had this really weird experience where, you know, I never believed in kind of like people who did readings or projections, but I was introduced to this person and she had an, she has an uncanny ability where she'd never met me and I don't talk. I, I mean, we now talk a little, but I gave her like the time and date I was born. And, um, she would give me very specific dates where very specific things would happen. And as a guy who's very <laughs> data driven, I was like, yeah, this is BS. So in November of 2016, she's like on February 8th of next year, something's going to change with your house. And I am not making it up on February 8th. I bought this house. I live in now. This proceeded over many years with many events. She, the day before I left my last marriage, she said tomorrow, your like home situation is going to change like permanently. And the next day I ended up like, you know, leaving my second wife. He told me on May 25th, you're going to do a handshake deal and your financial situation will change. And it happened. So, so I have this idea, which is when we, what's her number. Can I get a number please? <laughs> what we don't think about is this is not a foreign concept. When you look at the night sky, if a star is 1 million light years away, when it hits us now, we're looking 1 million years back in time. That star mm -hmm. could be gone. Mm -hmm. It could be a whole change thing. And you wouldn't know for 1 million years. Oh, yeah. In, in, a, in a way, yeah. if you were far enough away from the Earth, you could watch. It's, you know, 
I, I know this is now a more sensitive topic, but Christopher Columbus discover America or the the moon, you know, the launch of uh, the the first rocket into space. The light is out there. If you were far enough away standing there, that's what you would see. And so if you if you yep. sort of think on that scale that at any given time, we are actually seeing history. Every night when you look up at the night sky, you mm -hmm. are seeing mm -hmm. the past. Mm -hmm. And so it's not crazy to think that, you know, it could be possible because the Big Bang's a crazy idea, right? There was nothing. It's it nothing. is possible. And it's 13.4 billion years old. They think the universe might last 100 billion plus years or whatever. Oh, dude. It's really possible even analytically to say, hey, look, it might have all already happened. And we're just experiencing yes. it. And there might be some unique out of 8 billion people, some people who somehow, just like I see a star, the light of a star from a million years ago, they somehow see they're standing in a position where they see the light of what happened in the future, but it's the past to them, if that makes sense. Just like we're looking at the star. Yes. You know, if you were. If you were sort of in some, you can imagine being outside the system looking in, you see what already has happened. And so it's not an, it's a sort yeah. of idea that gives me comfort in an odd way because it says, hey, look, if you don't, you can't really impact that much outside yourself. You're given these tools that if you pay attention to them, your brain, your heart, and your soul, they'll guide you. And so when you don't pay attention to them, I can promise you, when I didn't, the outcomes were bad. And I can promise you when I did, the outcomes were better. So my thing about life is like, I'm a pragmatist. So what's the practical? Will this lead me to a place I want to be? Will it move me forward? And what I found of all the mental models I had, which ranged from, ah, uh, you know, there's no God or soul, your feelings don't matter, all that, to this new model over time, which is like, yeah, your feelings matter to you. It doesn't mean it's going to change the world. And hey, your soul's there to tell you, are you doing what you were meant to do? I find it's a very pragmatic framework to live because it, it brings you to a much happier and more productive and positive life. And there's no greater feeling as a human being. If you're selfish and do just for yourself, you're never, ever going to be happy as when you lose yourself to some greater good. I, I read some... Something like, I like hey, if you in whenever, when was Notre Dame built? Like 14th century or 12th, 14th. If you walked up and you saw somebody laying bricks and you said to them, what are you doing? They're like, oh, I'm laying bricks. It's hot sun. I'll never see this thing finished. This is, you know, they're not paying me enough. It's total crap. Of course, you're going to feel like junk. If you walk 20 feet down the way and you talk to the next bricklayer and you say, what are you doing? They say, I'm building Notre Dame, like, which will stand for the ages. And, you know, I'm, I'm committing my life to this greater purpose. You can lose yourself. And that's what I found is the most exciting flow moments in my life are when I'm not thinking about myself, I'm thinking I'm a part of something much bigger than myself. I, I would definitely agree with that. And I think uh, actually, if you've been to uh, Europe or if you're in Europe listening to this now, you, you definitely should check out some of those cathedrals. There are some in Spain, obviously some in the UK that are, you know, a thousand years old now, and they took 500 to a thousand years to build. And you think about the human determination to build something of this magnitude. Some of them are still under construction. And you think, you know, now I can't even finish a whole New York Times article, <laughs> you know, and yet there's generations of a whole family dedicated to just one wing of a cathedral in Barcelona, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. So. Same thing with the pyramids, I mean, I was, yeah, right? Exactly. So, why why can't we? And I know we're going woo woo now, but why can't? Why is it so difficult for us to recreate? I know we probably could recreate the pyramids, but it would be very difficult. How come it's so difficult now, but they could do it? I, I mean, a couple ideas come to me. The first is when you there are certain forms of government and societal structure that we think are inherently better, like democracy. And democracy is much better for most things, but not for getting stuff done. I went to China no. every <laughs> single year from 2011 to like 2018 or 19. I was looking at doing business there. And here's, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, 
I'm not advocating. I love where you're going with this. Keep going on the tangent. I love where I'm you're just going. Comparing systems. China no, here I in America, it. if they want to build a dam, it's decades of environmental studies, people decades. fighting, imminent committees, the, you know, whatever, fucking. some fish in a river or a sardine or whatever. Uh-huh. And Meetings. Meetings and interest groups. In China, when they wanted to build the Three Gorges Dam, I think they were like, you a couple million, I was like millions of people, they're like, you people, like, you're going to move. And we're going to put up this dam and we're going to flood it and we're going to do it fast. So number one thing is, I mean, authoritarianism generally isn't good for individuals, but it's very effective at getting things done. And we see this right now, by the way, in like the crypto world with yep. the emergence of DAOs and trying to think about running a decentralized autonomous structure versus centralized structure. So I think the number one thing is like when you have pure and total authority, you can make things happen that others can't, you know, number two. Now, now hold on. Now, what about the G now, when you think about like America back in the fifties, sixties, seventies, when we were so productive, what were we doing during that time? That's different than now. Well, I think a couple of things have happened in society. The first thing is like human beings used to expect hardship, misery, pain, and suffering every day. Yes. I, when I became a citizen in 2011, um, I read about all the founding fathers and and George Washington um, was striking. One of the things that I remember <laughs> is he apparent first, you know, you heard about his teeth and all that, but apparently he had like a tumor in his leg and he sat down in a chair and a doctor cut it out and he didn't make a sound. You know, most of us, if we like cut our finger now, are like, oh my God, you know, it's the worst oh, thing yeah. ever. So I think the general, um, what I call, for lack of a better word, entitlement or view that we should be happy and life should be easy has been a sort of um, mounting change that's, you know, even now more than ever. So I think with the, mm-hmm. with the comforts, you know, we, um, I think it's called the um, homeostatic, uh basically like what i humans adjust to whatever what i found is you know everyone i know if they're like hey if you have 50 bucks they're like if i just had 100 bucks all that i could do then they get the 100 bucks they're like if i just had a thousand bucks then they get the thousand they're like well if i just had so we adjust all the time to our circumstances and i think people generally particularly in the age of the internet and so on things have changed but Look, we're now, even when I was a kid, you didn't have a phone. My child, my kids expect to be kind of kept busy all day. When I was a kid, it was like school ended. You'd like get on your bike and try to figure out something to do. And Oh, I was saying that to Sarah now. Like I rarely have a moment where I don't have at least headphones in my head because I don't want to be bored for a second. I can't be bored for it. What if I'm, what if I stop walking the dogs? Yeah, exactly. So I think like we generally think we're entitled to be happy and comfortable. And one of my big practices (laughs) every day is to remind myself and I do a whole bunch of things every morning and every day, but most of the history of human humans and of other animals, like is trying to survive every second of the day. Happiness was a luxury. If you're a wild animal that hasn't been killed by humans, like you don't wake up and go to the grocery store, you know, you're like a moment of peace yep. is celebrated because yep. you didn't get them. Whereas now we're used to like comforts. The other thing I think is like, look, I used to be able to read books. I was a maniacal reader for an enormous amount of time. Now when I want information, I just use the internet and I find books like slow and drudging and hard. And so I think we're just all used to like a lot of comfort, you know, I mean, I can't imagine if I kind of like to read a bit about the Industrial Revolution and how things were in like the 1890s and so on. But if you threw me back there, I'm sure I'd go nuts, you know, after a week, you know, but uh, just because we're so. You know, one thing that that blows my mind, it blows my mind, just the, the, the effect of globalization. And I go to the grocery store and I think every day I'm a I'm a fruit fanatic. I love berries, you know, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, uh, you know, pineapple, kiwi, and I'm in Oregon, okay? 
And every day I go and I get fruits that were picked from Chile, Mexico, you know, they have shit from Tanzania in there every day. And there's a ship that comes and then it goes onto a train and then it goes onto a, a, a truck and then it goes on to, into my fucking house. And then I put it in an electric car and it goes back to my refrigerated house from Chile. And, and that's something that I've come to expect as normal. And I bitch when I say these strawberries, they're not very good. Well, Adam <laughs> Smith, today. You read the original Adam Smith, um, Wealth of Nations. That was the beauty. He said, look, the beauty of is how these systems emerge. So I'm with you. So I think I think several things have changed, too. If you look in the 50s, like the percent, the kind of general view of how much the, of the economy the government was versus how much the government is now. Oh, um, yeah. I think... Also, the culture, look, culture, we've talked here about language and so on, but ultimately, like, culture is a huge determinant of many, many things, and I do think, you know, not, look, there were many, one of the, one of the things growing up in a different time where things were, like, much harsher and you were expected to fight or do a bunch of other stuff is, you were tougher yep. and meaner. The positive of this generation, I find out my children, is yep. they're so much more lovely and sweet and nice. And they are. You know, I, I accidentally like made, you know, uh, used language that was just from my past describing a, something. And my daughters immediately were like, you can't, you know, dad, that's not kind to say. And I was like, oh, uh -huh. I didn't even. Uh -huh. So I think, what do I think has changed? I think the. Generally speaking, technology and culture have changed, globalization and how Americans view themselves in the world. Number two is like means of change. The average person, as much as we complain, the average person in the 50s, there were tons of people in America who still had nothing and lived in a T-shirt and, you know, in rural America, most people with crap all. And now most Americans live at an incredibly high standard of living. Look, the Russian GDP is something like 10 and a half thousand per capita ukraine's only 3500 per capita the u.s and china's around ten and a half thousand the u.s is sixty three thousand plus per capita and look many western nations are now like you know singapore and so on are higher than us i believe so generally we've become much wealthier and every wealthy person i know i hate to say it is more entitled they think because they have wealth they're special um and i do think the Next thing is just the percentage of the economy the government is. If you look back, I you know one of the things that makes me excited about Ethereum, particularly in in the crypto, and is like look the U.S. government. I think U.S. GDP is now approximately twenty four trillion, up from like twenty one and a half trillion over the last couple of years. U.S. debt is twenty eight trillion. It's gone up six trillion in the because of COVID. The White House's own projections are like seven and a half trillion of debt added between now and, and the end of 2026, which means it'll be like 10 or 12 trillion, which means we're going to have like 40 trillion. Of debt. That's nuts, man. And so what we, How, we'll never yeah, escape that. What we've done is we've really become entitled to <clears throat> comforts and kind of pulling from the future. And so I think as a result, the bigger the government becomes, the more people, and you've seen, I actually think one of the enormous co contributing factors of negative to negative uh, equity, like generally in society is the massive decline in interest rates. So if you look back when I started again in 1998, risk-free rates were like 5%. And that was a time still when CEOs only earned like 20 times the average person, 12 to 20. One of the huge negative impacts of ne interest rates being zero is anyone who has assets gets way wealthier. And anyone who doesn't gets way relatively poorer. And you've seen this in society. Like nobody wants to talk about it. But yep. when you have interest rates go to zero and then technologies emerge that promote centralized structures like, you know, Web2 because it shows advertising and because of corporate America's growth and ability to lobby and pay zero debt, you've had a massive increase in the biggest companies and the richest people and a huge spread. So I think. Um, you get this weird cycle then where all of a sudden there's huge inequity and people feel like, hey, what's the government doing for me? They're spending all this money and I want more 
share of it. You know, everyone's now getting used. I know people are like, oh, I got another check. You know, I hope I get another check or here comes my big refund. And so all of a sudden it's shifted the nature of how people look at government, where a huge portion of society is dependent on government now for a reasonable portion of their income, which I understand in a way because interest rates have gone to zero and it's helped rich people, but it leads to this odd structure now where, and we've been able to do this in the U.S., because 70% of our debt is basically held outside the country. So for every bit of inflation right. we issue, people in China and uh, around the world are really bearing that for us. So when this comes to an end is when another reserve currency appears, which I'm not saying Bitcoin or Ethereum is there yet or anything. But right now, if you look at what's happening, it's a little like, like uh, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum have been going up. Because like if you're in Russia and you can't have rubles or Ukraine, you either want dollars or Bitcoin or Ethereum because you can use that anywhere. And so I think we've created a structure that's highly challenging. I spent a lot of time where you have a highly, you know, I I can't figure it out yet. I'm still trying, but huge government as a percent. Look, I think the government, these are rough numbers. I haven't looked at them recently, but. Roughly speaking, the government takes in like three to four trillion and spends six to seven. So um, on an economy that's 24, that's huge. You know, they're like the government. And then they have now in every industry, you're basically, it used to be you were like running your industry and there were some regulations. Now the regulations determine pretty much everything in every industry, you know, and people. So the government is just a business that's perpetually underwater, except the only thing is it makes money. It's the one that creates money. Well, it can so. print money. So if I borrow, I can't go, yeah. Daniel. I mean, I can if I make it my own token, but Daniel, it's like, hey, um, you know, I'm going to borrow a hundred bucks from you. And then I have a printing press and I can just print another hundred. That works until some point yeah. where you say, well, f- screw that. I'm not giving you, I'm not, you're going to have to pay me in some other, something else or guarantee me some other stuff. So I definitely think we're in uncharted waters. Um, and look, big deficit spending started in the 80s with Reagan trying to bankrupt Russia effectively and revving up military spend. And at the beginning, people were like, oh, it's going to destroy the comp- country. I remember even in 2008, a $250 billion bailout was like viewed as insane. Now, they're, you know, politicians are having to spend 400 billion or 400 billion, like 150 billion on giving internet to people or whatever, you know, it's not even, yeah, so I just think the whole scale and scope. And and then finally, the last piece is like, look, work-life balance used to mean like I have four kids. And when I have sole custody, I have four drop-offs from 805 to 840 in the morning. When I say work-life balance is like, yo, I got to get these kids to school and like I, I don't have a choice, so I have to like balance that with working. I think that's morphed and it's to be like, hey, I like to I don't want all this pressure from work. I need like a day a week to snowboard and or whatever, which I just think um, you know, people don't want to work as much as a result of the factors we've outlined and the change in culture. And look, if you look at Europe, Europe, what my takeaway is is like, look. All Western countries face this problem. And Japan was actually the first, but Japan has something different than us. They're a homogenous culture. It's like, you know, everyone in Japan is pretty much Japanese, 95% of tourists there. Their debt to cap, their debt to GDP is like almost four times if you add everything, GDP. And so they've like, you know, effectively, they used to be, remember, you know, in the 80s, they were sort of the equivalent of China now. And yeah, and as a result of all this indebtedness and so on, it's really impacted their growth. China has a different problem, which is they had 40 years of one child policy. And so, again, on China, I have a slightly different view, which is like when you ha- don't have kids, one kid for every two people for 40 years. And you're generally a society who celebrates like hand Chinese, bat, you know, ethnicities and doesn't like non hand Chinese <laughs> ethnicities. Um, I, you're like, you don't want immigrants just like America, unfortunately has, was built on immigrants, but somehow is anti-immigrant. You start running into some major problems. What I, yeah. What I think is interesting too, is, uh, 
which I know is, is kind of, it's, it's tangential to what you're saying. We're talking about Russia and Ukraine, and we're talking about issues that they're having. What I think is interesting is the coverage, because everyone is so hyped up to like help Ukraine, bad Russia, when there are European countries being invaded by other European countries, civilized countries. But this is happening in Africa and brown Asia all the time, and no one's getting the panties in a bunch. It's happening every day. Well, I mean, the worst I remember for me was when in Rwanda when that was happening. And like, I was like, oh my God, we're basically like, look, I, I think. Um, Aren't those countries part of NATO too? I actually, you know, I don't know if, uh, I, I'm not a huge like student of NATO. And, but I do think calling it like it is, I mean, if you're white and European, it definitely get more attention from America you, yeah. if you're black. You're getting a lot more. They're, they're like, oh, World War Three is about to start. Like, dude, this is happening in Africa and Latin America well, China, and Asia China actually all was the smart time. On this. What China did is they went, I think what they called their rail, and they had a name for the policy, but they went all over the world and built ports and infrastructure in all these countries that America was overlooking. And look, if I don't think it's a shock to anybody to say there's a long history in America of racism. And yeah, I, I, in China, they in, well, in China they have a genocide program going on with the with the with the Muslim population. The they have a re-education camp. Yeah, the, the Uyghurs. Yeah, yeah the Uyghurs. 100%. Sterilization. That's what I was saying. Like, We're not well, getting look, all the, the Asian you know countries. And again, I'm this is uh, just observational. I think based on data. Having visited, yeah, like I yeah. went, so I was selling to the Philippines, and I went and visited, and one of the most horrible things I saw was uh, and this was like in the last you know 10 years um, was like a factory in the Philippines owned by I believe Taiwanese and they had like separate they had segregation like actual segregation like, I, like the bathroom for the Filipinos was like disgusting you got like two pieces of paper you couldn't be a manager they lived in separate parts of like the town so in Asia Filipinos and, and Taiwanese or Filipinos Taiwanese, and Taiwanese, I think it was just like a random, but right. Asian countries are, look, you could say America is super racist. Asian countries and are very racist. Most They're countries, very racist unfortunately, too. Unfortunately, especially, look, humans, humans have a weird thing. Like in a way, if we were off our planet and meeting some Martian, we'd be like, oh, you're a human and I'm human. Great. But when you're on the same planet, you're like, oh, you're Russian and I'm Ukrainian. Like, I'm I'm not Russian, Ukrainian. Like, you know, you're bad, I'm good or whatever. So we have, based on history, it made sense. Look, I, I was listening to something that says there's three parts to our mind. There's like the what's been like through our DNA program, which is a lot of things like fear of others, fear of the dark, fear of spiders, things that like protected humans for years yeah. that aren't as applicable now. Two is your own experience where you like create biases based on, Hey, I, you know, um, look, I, I can't simply, I can't imagine what it's like to be directly impacted by racism, but I'll tell you, ain't nobody in Ross look like me. And if somebody comes, I was walking my kid and somebody saw me in their driveway covered in tattoos like this, and they didn't know me. And they immediately were looking at me like I was, you know, some criminal. And so I think it's a natural human thing when people are different from you if you're not focused on. Well, I was talking more about the coverage oh, yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah. The, co the coverage is interesting, oh, yeah, the yeah. way that they I cover it. It's hard to know, you know and, and, and how much attention but it yeah, gets. Of course. Well, I also I, think, though, there's a nuclear... The nuclear wanna, yeah. Look, Russia had a long history of being a big geopolitical player. No doubt there's racism, but I'm saying I think in this instance, because Russia has nukes, and it's next to Europe. Absolutely, it's getting more attention. Yeah, and I don't even. Th I think. I think the racism part is just part of it. I think it's also like the the way that we always play against Russia. We need the boogeyman. I don't. Th I, from what I've seen, Russia is in the wrong. But I, I find myself wondering. I only see a certain type of coverage, and someone left a comment on the blog earlier, and they're like, "Well, you know, Russia has several reasons that they are, you know, quote protecting their territory, blah blah." And they were posting news articles, and I haven't read them. But I just wonder, what is Russia's perspective on this? Is it just Vladimir Putin going crazy? Because that's that's how they're painting. They say Vladimir Putin is crazy. But isn't that what they said about Trump? And it's like, you know, 
Like Who's crazy these stuff. days? Yeah. The reporter yeah. or the, you know, Trump was crazy too. But, but I think look, you know, one thing I think is difficult for America, for us in America to consider is imagine if Canada and Mexico were armed and anti-U.S. And I think we have this yeah, that'd be horrible. That'd be horrible. unintended, like as a result of our geography being so separate, we're not surrounded by. Yeah. So I think number one thing, and once again, I, I'm not yeah. sympathizing or on the side of Russia. In fact, I, I think the idea of invading a country in 2022 that's your neighbor is not acceptable. Pretty, but it's a pretty bad idea. Having said yeah. that, I think trying to, I always try to prove myself wrong or take the other point. Like, why can I be wrong? What? And I definitely, this is complex and I don't understand this issue. But look, if 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 Russia took over Canada and put missiles there, I wouldn't be happy. And I think, like you said, I'm no. sure there's some story on the other side that, hey, Ukraine was trying to join NATO and NATO is anti-Russia and it's right on the border. But I don't, on this one, unfortunately, I think, unprovoked aggression and look a lot of history and what we don't what we don't think about is like most of the lines like take africa you're talking about the country and uh, the way africa was divided was intentionally done so by the british to prevent groups they put multiple groups in the same country so that just like on the slave ships they would put people who didn't speak the same language so they couldn't unite against the same thing they did when they divided colonial, well, colonial colonies so that they could not unite to, to overthrow the British or whoever the colonial, the imperialist was. So There's also just deep histories that we don't understand as Westerners looking in. Look at the Middle East. We're like, we need peace in the Middle East and just support each other. And just, you know, it's just like, I don't, I don't really understand what's going on on a deep level in Israel and Palestine, only from the surface. But that, you know... It's kind of like we're asking for something that they're not going to be able to provide because the situation just isn't right for it. Well, I think your, you know, your two general points which I agree with are one, generally there's like racist coverage and attention in the Western media. Check. And two, that there's a sure. long and complex history with both sides feeling, which is, you know, feeling wronged or that they're right in many of these situations and three what i think it stems back to the ussr right because ukraine was part of the ussr and ukraine the, the whole thing dispersed well, i think i think the issue and here that was, is the that eastern wasn't... side of ukraine has more russian speakers, russian sympathizers like actual russian descent people of russian descent okay and like speak russian the western part is you know is not similar and, and it's a bit i hate to say it it's like when you know the germans said oh in the um you know in this part of we have to go into this part of czechoslovakia where it's Poland, Poland, because or, there's like germans not yeah. being treated right i that's what that's why i'm saying it's like the start of world oh, yeah. war ii it's it's, it's, a, it's a similar setup of oh we have to annex this territory that's what's called it's called annexing it you see there I are think, I think people us, like you over there and you're like oh we're just gonna is, you don't know when territory. you read anything. Remember to read it with a critical right. eye and understand that you likely don't understand the history. And if you want to have an opinion, that's why I started this with, look, I've, I'm not, I've read about the different sides in this recent conflict, but I don't in any way feel. Any I feel bad for anybody that dies, period. About, it does feel you wrong know? though. I will tell you that it feels wrong to me to, it feels wrong. I feel any, I feel bad for anybody who dies. Period on either side. It's unnecessary. Period. Um, but I yeah. But I, but I but I question more now. I want to read. I want to read a Russian news source. I want to read something in, in Belarus. Then I want to read question something. Question everything. You know. Always and ask. Remember first. Let's go back a step. Media is a for profit undertaking that is as I took there a break you go. many years ago. I stopped reading the news for a while because I realized look. We were talking about how people are influenced. The news uses all the tactics in the world to make you want to read it so they can sell your attention to an yeah. advertiser. And attention. So they're using it's, it's the product. product that you're buying. Yeah. And so yes. So I think um, cultivating where and how you take in information is 
one of the most important things in the quotes information age or whatever you want to call it, where like we're all well and let me ask you this too now i'm just now you got now you got me on my my, 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 my mind going uh do you think it's ironic just ironic, and i was going to make a post about this and i said you know what let me just not instagram's already slapping me let me just <laughs> leave it alone don't you think it's ironic that as soon as COVID starts to die down a little bit, now this comes as, oh, the new thing to focus on. Attention, attention, attention. It's like, we couldn't even get a break. Omicron just kind of stopped being a big Super deal. Super bummer. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah, I mean, but it's just it's just too perfect. They always need something. So it makes me want to not care about it. Well, I can see this. why I mean, you get like, I care, like but... news fatigue. Um, I, I think uh, one thing I do think about a lot of the belief that, um, look, one thing I always remind myself, when we went to apply for the PPP loans, the website crashed. And when I go to the DMP, mm -hmm. I have to wait yeah. for hours. The idea that there could be a global coordinated conspiracy, <laughs> uh, I'm not anything's possible, but pro I live in probabilities. I just think like, Look, if you have if you if you They're tell two good. people something, chances are one of them's gonna you know if you don't know them, test and you tell them don't say anything. So I just think it's much harder to kind of coordinate. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's just the tendency of the media to always oh, focus on the next disaster. Well, everything had to be but, it, but papers, it's accelerating man. or it's so, so yeah. It's just, so it, but it's just it's, it's so much. You know, and, I, and it's like, you know, you got to ask the question, when is enough enough? And are they contributing to the betterment of our society? Not that we don't need to know the news about Russia. That's important. But it's just like whenever I, you know, I, I come, you know, I, I lived in Florida for most of my life. I mean, you lived in the Caribbean. When there's a hurricane coming, they don't shut up about the hurricane. They will keep it on the news channel the whole day. And you're like, I get it. It's coming. It's coming. And it starts to become... Fatigue. Absolutely. I didn't live in the Caribbean. And I'm now we were constantly on Hurricane yes, Watch. My parents are from there. Yeah. Oh, well, well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, okay. Yeah. I think yeah. what you're saying is they're, look, they're selling sensationalism, and we all know that. And unfortunately, look, you know what I've noticed going back to what we about earlier? Yeah. Is most people aren't willing to do the work to learn. It takes a lot of time to dig into things and truly understand them. And and you know most people i've found don't want to do the drudging drudging sort of investigation that is required to have a point of view you know i mm -hmm. when i do mm -hmm. i have a million faults but whenever i get into something i get like crazy into it because my idea is like look how do you know yeah, how you do know. you know when i if you're going to get a tattoo and, and you look at three tattoos and pick one i mean as opposed to you get a tattoo and you've looked at 10 or 20,000 or 30,000 or you just have such a different perspective. And I think a lot of the time now people don't take the time, like you said, to have, to have even enough knowledge to have a view yet. They hold quite strong views based on almost nothing and yes. often on stuff that's total bullshit. So you said strong views loosely held. I believe right? it's slightly different. I believe in strong views loosely held if you've done the work. And so you're like, hey, as of now, I think everything's just like a good way to think about it rather than right or wrong is like, what's the probability? And I like to be high probability stuff. You know, when I do an investment, I always say not just a high expected value. I want a high probability of a good outcome, low probability of a bad one. And if I get the bad outcome, it's little downside. And if I get the good outcome, it's lots of upside. And so, but I think yep. all of life is just sort of probabilities, like, you know, and once you view it that way, like uh, getting informed so you can have a strong view, like right now I have a strong view on Ethereum um, and the outlook for Ethereum and the high probability of a good outcome. But if I get data tomorrow that suggests that's not the case, then I'll change my mind. And I think we have a society now that somehow values not you know people like saying something and never changing their mind whereas to me that's pure idiocy if you do something if you learn something new that contradicts your position you should change your position 
you know, or start looking more into it until it's compelling enough that you, you know, you, you change your position. That's not weakness. That's strength. Weakness. And, is, and, is and, and being there. honest with yourself enough. Yeah. To get, to give yourself objective feedback and just, just dispassionate, dis, dis, disconnecting from the criticism of it. It's like, cause there's the, there's the, the fact of it and then there's the criticism behind it. So I made this mistake that's the fact of it. Then the criticism is this means I'm stupid, dumb, this, that, the other thing. And that's the thing that makes you not want to examine the truth of it. So if you've made a mistake with, you know, uh, relationship, money, business, uh, you know, investment, just quote on the line, just examine that and then be like, okay, how do I not do that again? And then all the other garbage, the mental garbage is very unnecessary. As long as you don't, don't keep doing it. Well, here's but, what I'd say. You know, Number one is talk ask yourself if somebody talked to you like you're talking to yourself what would you do number two accept that you're going to make mistakes it's a fact i guarantee you there's no you're going to make mistakes yep. so if you don't have a mechanism for correcting and adjusting for mistakes then good luck in life uh, number <laughs> three uh um i think once you recognize you're going to make mistakes and talk to yourself in the proper way an easier way to is talk to yourself as if you were giving advice to daniel or to me or somebody where like you said it's just not personal and life gets so much easier the minute you put your ego and emotions on the line or you really ego is one of the biggest things that can cause you to make huge mistakes and so i think um you know put those things aside try to get to well, the and move on. Look, it's hard not. To, I spend a lot of look. I every day meditate and so on to try not to dwell on the past. But I'll tell you, we're talking about narratives and so on. I still find it very difficult not to replay past events and retell past stories. Oh but, yeah, you know that's that's kind of the job is to move on, understand you're going to make mistakes, make peace with it, and move forward. Keep moving forward. Just be aware when you're sometimes living in the story and don't even realize that you're playing a movie right now. What, what, what I was going to ask you is, um, and I'll, you know, we can kind of like start sh for shaping towards the end here because I was, I was realizing as I was um, looking through the statistics on my YouTube channel, this is surprising, but kind of surprising, kind of not really, but it, it may be like, I think maybe is this inaccurate, but 98% of my audience is uh, are, are males 25 to 34 which I guess makes sense because that's me, but I thought 98%. And in the past when I've polled, it was closer to 60, 40 on my email, but YouTube is very heavily male transitioning from 20s to 30s. And I'm wondering now, since you've gone 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and you're between 40 and now going to 50, what would you say, what would you be your advice to the male going from 20 to 30 or going, going from 30s to mid 30s in that range? What would be your advice? Don't get sued. We talked about that. You talked about that. Actually, I think um, the first advice is to understand, you know, from about until your mid twenties as a male, what whatever mammals they've shown studies that teenage male mammals like have brains that miscalculate risk and are overconfident. Whether you're a cheetah or a gorilla or a human, um, I also think for me the amount of change between the age of twenty five and forty was just immense. So I think understanding when you're in your 20s and going in your 30s, that you're still in a period of change and formation and be cautious about committing to lifelong decisions that maybe in seven to 10 years, you'll be quite a different person and along quite a different path. Um, I think, look, you know, I, somebody was commenting how they were spending time with me in their early 20s, how like cocksure and certain they were. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of the pleasure of being in your early 20s. You haven't been broken by life. Feels it's good. Like <laughs> you haven't been humbled by life. And I noticed with my friends, you no. know, through experience and probably like the offset of aging and its impact on your hormones and the like, you like mellow out. I think the, the biggest thing for everyone in life is find not what you think you should want or whatever. Find what you love. If you don't find what you love and you're trying to do something 
you're going to be competing against somebody like I'm when I do what I love, I'm doing it around the clock and it never feels like work. It shouldn't feel like work. I'm not saying you don't have to work hard or work around the clock, but if you're doing something you love, all you want to do is more and more and more of it. And it, and it's the best life. So I'd say the, the job in your twenties is to sort, try on a bunch of different stuff until you find something that sings to you. And the best way if nothing sings to you is hang around with weirdos like me and Daniel who are passionate about stuff because people who are passionate about stuff, passion's contagious. Like if, if you're, you know, if you talk to somebody who's super into something, they'll be like, oh my God, did you see this? Or what about that and this? And you'll see something will sp speak to you. And don't just like, one thing I did is like, I thought I should want to like something. Um, and don't feel that way. Spend the time. You're lucky because you have 40 years productive plus if you live a normal life or 50 from there. So the job in your 20s, even through your 30s. Look, I'm on chapter three on, of my life. I spent over a decade in finance, 13 years in operating companies. And now at almost 47, I'm starting the third chapter. So you can do that. Like, you know, this is a wonderful country and time where your job is to find what sings for you and follow that because this that will lead to the happiest life. And don't focus on money. Money is the outcome of doing wonderful stuff. And this is, you know, I remember when I started in the powder coatings business, I went to a customer who at the time was huge for us, buying hundreds of thousands. And I went and saw and they were making these things that like just spun in the wind. Okay. It was like a piece of metal stamped and it would like go in the wind. And they were selling like, it was like millions of dollars business. And I said, Jesus Christ, you know, like I can't in America though. <laughs> and in the world now, like if you love, I'm going to make, I don't know, native American basket weaving. And that drives you. I'm telling you the money and the life will come. The, the world's big enough that the thing that matters is you being passionate. And if you work hard and care, you're ahead of 90% of people. And many people end up miserable. By the way, you know, even if they're super wealthy, I've met many people with tons of money who are terribly miserable and people with almost no money who are super happy and the real driver. And then, so find what you love and are passionate. And then for me, the hardest lesson is if you're going to be a partner with somebody in life, be very, um, take that decision incredibly seriously because if you get yes. that wrong, I'm lucky. I get along incredibly well with my first wife and she's a wonderful person. But if you get this decision wrong, it will take the joy out of the rest of your life. And I had a friend who did, I remember him, this is when it really struck me and it struck me in my own life, but he did one of the biggest deals in his industry in the history. And he called me and he's like, look, Steven, I should be celebrating and feeling great, but I feel terrible. And so my second bit of advice is be very, the most if somebody said to you, I have an investment for you, your bank, your family, your money, your house, your friendships, um, and your day-to-day -day life, and it fails 50% of the time, in a way, that's what marriage is. Marriages fail 50% of the time on the first marriage, 65% on the second. And when they fail, if you're with the wrong person, it can lead to really unfortunate outcomes. 65 percent on the second that's interesting why, why do you think it would no, go down on the second i'm twice divorced it's way easier to leave the second time the first time you don't leave until like because oh. you're like i'm the biggest failure ever but after you've done it once but you think you'd wait you think you'd wait or you, th you think you'd know or you think you think you'd, you think you'd pick better the second time actually if you think about the statistics we said i think there was uh when we were together last time you're like oh what's the chances you know, two of us have the same name or the two birthday, same birthday. And the statistics, I think, is Bayesian right. analysis, which is yeah. it's what's the chance of it not being the case. And so what I'd say is when you failed at marriage once, there's probably something inherent. You could say it could just be bad luck or it could be like maybe in the case of me, I'm willing to say like, hey, the structure itself or maybe I'm not as good as at it. 
And so the chance that you'd fail the second time is higher. It's like somebody who's, you know, failed at something over and over. Often, if they keep doing the same thing, they'll fail again. So it's surprising, but I think it's a factor of, one, you've done it before, so you're less scared because it's like scary as heck, you know, the first time you get divorced, you feel, I tell you from personal experience, I never felt like more of a failure. So then you've gone through it. The, yeah, no. the other thing is, you know, the data is, hey, you failed once already. Like I always joke, I said, if I have to bet on anything, if my whole life depended on me getting married again, right, it's a much tougher bet than on me figuring out what to do <laughs> right in my career. So, so yeah, so I think those are two things. Find yeah. what you love and pursue it. And if you partner with somebody else, take that as probably the biggest decision in your life. I'll dovetail off those because they resonate a lot for me. And I've spent the better part of my career um, trying to find the best ways to combine what I love to do with what intersects with the market interest. And, uh, and then also building skills on top of that to generate more interest for it. And we were joking because you were like, how did I even <laughs> find you? And I'm like, the you internet, man, I know how to go out here and do the little things. And you found me just through Instagram and I was advertising this program, NWP, New Way Protocol, we're going to do this. And so it's this coaching program. And we, the, the first time we met up last month, we, we, did, we did fight camp yeah. in LA. Yeah, for sure. How was the fight so, camp? And the third thing I'd say too is take care of your, your physical vessel as much as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy to, especially in your 20s, that you feel invulnerable. But yeah, as to you, Daniel, I applaud yeah. you. I was going to say, you know, I don't know how we found each other, but that's another sign. The universe connects <laughs> to the people you should be connected to. But yeah, so those would be my three things. Well, find your passion, find yeah, the right partner, I... and do your best to take care of your physical, mental and emotional, you know, heart, mind, soul, so that you can be your best version of yourself. Those are my, I completely agree. And those are my, my same sentiments. Like I've, I've worked so hard to do things that I, uh, that are interesting to me, genuinely interesting and uh, will still provide me with what I need. So this, this program that we launched this, this past year was the, the ultimate pinnacle of that by combining all the things I like. And then you'll, you'd be interested to know that like lots of people also have the same things I like as their interests. So you out there listening have this idea for a product or a service and you're like, oh, I'm the only one that likes Native American <laughs> basket weaving. But guess what? Go on Etsy, bro. There is chic, premium Native American clothing on there, which is like expensive, you know, dope stuff. And there's a market for pretty much everything. So don't doubt your own abilities. Uh, as With regards to the relationship, I absolutely agree. I, I don't know how... I don't know how I've been able to maintain this relationship. It's been uh, it, because we, Sarah and I met on OkCupid of all places on OkCupid in 2010 uh, in Atlanta. And I was 22 at that time. And she was 17 going on 18, going on 18. She lied on her profile. And we've gone through several transformations of oh, serious issues with the relationship. Oh, well, it's about to break up been in multiple states, multiple houses, all this crap. It is hard, dude. It's hard. And um, it's a, it seemed like about a 50-50 shot, yeah. you know? It <laughs> and it's, it just, it's, nev it's never easy. It basically is. And you have to constantly be also changing yourself to accommodate their changes. And then if it's not a good fit from the beginning, sometimes you never quite find the match. I don't know, man. But definitely finding the right partner. Because think about it. The person you spend the most time with has the greatest impact on your mental health. You know who that is, by the and way, if, for all of us? <laughs> yourself hmm. you know, that, yeah, that's the second what well, exactly yourself is the first yes. starting point of everything yes and well then the, the first person external to that the second person that's right. would be your life partner and, and i think you made another they, point daniel they, that's good is i think wait you're lucky that you've been able to do that my suggestion generally is because the 20s and 30s are such a time of transformation that particularly men, I would observe, I have three daughters and a son, but uh, my observation is for whatever reason, it seems men go through a lot of transformation in that time. And so sometimes maybe waiting or just being quite certain, because, you know, remember when you pick a partner, you're both changing on your own 
as well as being together. And so it's quite a, it's quite right. a thing to, even if you love somebody and have shared values, you know, as you go down your path and they go down theirs, even if you love each other, you know, you're both doing a lot of changes and you're both in a way yourself, but a new version of yourself five or 10 years later. And so I think, you know, I know what I want to tell you. This, it was the same. I didn't even learn to express my feelings till five yeah. years ago, maybe four years ago. I'm serious. I didn't even know how to articulate what I was feeling. So I would just get no, mad. Was, that was me through 2012. <laughs> I was just. It feels so bad, though. It feels really bad. And I just figured that out. Or if I didn't get mad, I would just let it go in. And then it'll come out one way or another. Unhealthy. Yeah. In, in various behaviors. In various behaviors, unhealthy. And and I had a, what I thought was a decent upbringing. I think there's something to do with the male, the male model of how we're supposed to interact with the world. And we're not supposed to. That was causing problems in my relationship is what I'm saying. Because I couldn't express my needs. And you can't get your needs met if you can't say what you need. happened to me. I, my first wife and I are very close. She's a wonderful lady. But yeah, I went through that whole same cycle where it was very difficult for me to even put words to my emotions. I recently, uh, I recently, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, well, no, was, this is maybe, this is actually four or five months ago. I called a, uh, a woman, a young lady who uh, I'd known in my early 20s that I had just been real, just atrocious to, just, you know, just, just done some really fucked up shit to, just been not very nice and not very considerate of her feelings. And I called her and I just said, man, you know, I just want to let you know, I'm so sorry for having done that to you. And uh, I should definitely have not behave like that. And it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't, what is it isn't in line with who I am now. So I just want to let you know that I see that. And uh, it felt good to say that. And she said, you know, I uh, wasn't even thinking about that. And I hope that I didn't hurt you. So yeah. all these years I was thinking, oh, I fucked her up. I fucked her up. I fucked her up. And she's saying, yeah. are you okay? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I fucked you I've over. I've been lucky this time I've, so, I've been dating somebody. And from the beginning, I tried to never say anything hurtful or mean because you can never take that back and to try to implement these learnings. And, uh, but yeah, don't, once you said something terrible or done something terrible, you can never take that back. And most humans I find uh -huh. will remember having an impression of how you made them feel forever. Uh -huh. If you did something that wasn't a big deal to you, but you cut them down or hurt them or said something bad, I certainly never forget that myself. So I think that's a good policy is make sure you're not, saying to your partner anything once it leaves your mouth it can never be unsaid same same thing with anything physical you know if you hit somebody you can say i'm sorry and be very truly sorry about it but you can't hit somebody like that you can't do that i told my they're kids, gonna remember that once if you break up the best analogy is like once something's broken if you have a plate whether you meant to break it whether you intended to or not it's broken and there's only two courses of action from there fix the plate and spend the energy and time and you don't know if you'll end up with a plate as strong or good or worse or better or get a new one but you can't change that you've broken it and what applied before you broke the plate no longer applies once it's broken and so treat particularly those closest to you as a delicate wonderful thing what i've learned is you never know we all have these plans in life and imagined future life but you don't know what today is going to bring or tomorrow is going to bring you don't know if that person next to you who you imagine your whole life with you may never speak to again just like that or a job you thought you'd be at forever may yep. be gone just like that once you accept that and treat things as such and only let people and things close to you that are proven entities or you wait until they're proven um, I think you'll change a lot on how you do things because um, anything can disappear in a second. And um, so don't take for granted the wonderful people and things around you. Uh, you're the type of man that I want to be mushrooms with. I don't know if we can say that on air. I don't know. Can yeah. we say that on air? Yeah, it's <laughs> my show. Yeah. I can say that. Uh I totally agree. And, um, and try to live every, trying to live with that awareness. And it's easy to like 
zone out because we just have these like day-to-day things we have to do. I got to pay the fucking bills. I got to think about my taxes. I got to do all this stuff. And you get weighed down by the heaviness of the, the material and the, the having to do things. But then also the, the, the experience of getting to do things like I get to do this, but this is what I'm doing for a job. I'm getting to do this podcast. I'm talking to my friend, you know, I get to, um, you know, I get to train later. I feel my body is in great shape. That's the last thing you talked about physical body, paying attention to your physical body, appreciating the body for what it is. Even just thinking like right now I feel pain-free. That's great. Trust me, you know, I was thinking more it's so great that. to feel <laughs> I, well, yeah, and I do appreciate it. Hey, I get fucked up all the time. And when I don't feel fucked up, the absence of feeling fucked up feels amazing. And But the body, guys, if you're listening to this, especially if you're on my YouTube channel, 25 to 34-year-old men, um, seriously, this is the best compound interest you can have. Now, I started training heavily late teens, like 18, 19, 20, because I was doing bodybuilding shows on stage. I had a mankini. My mom shaved my butt. Do you got any uh, I, had, that, I was bronzed up and tanned up. Oh, I'll show you. I'll send them. Yeah, it's, they're gnarly, bro. Uh, and I was, I was pretty good too. I have, uh, let me see. I have one of my. Oh, I got one of my trophies here. No, I you know, help. but, but um, the, that was one of the best things I could have done for my life in terms of compound interest and ROI. Because one, when you get, especially if you're in your young twenties, five years of consistent training, three to five years of consistent training, where you're hitting it hard, your body will be set up. Not for life. You're still going to need to maintain it, but it's going to be at a baseline where you if memory. you get your abs you really memory. shredded, yeah, you get muscle memory. And you know, like if you get your abs really shredded one time or a couple times, you you know how far away you are from it. So you just have to go back to it. If you've never been there and you just keep piling fat on into your 40s and 50s, you'll never know where you're actually at. But get yeah, get your, get that muscle memory going. So now, listen, I'm not bragging, but if I stop training, it takes me about two months and I'm back up again, baby. But if I had to build that over again, build that from the beginning now at 34, not bad, but not as easy as having started. So if you're in your early 20s, get out and invest in that. And then just like your finances, it continues to well, come I think you're making one other point I'd probably add to my, you know, my recommendation. Recommendation four is if you are interested in something or like saying, it's way better to do a little bit every day over and over consistently. If you work mm-hmm. out three times a month hard versus four days a week <laughs> mellow over five years, mm-hmm. you're going to be in a totally different spot with the ladder. So do what I try to do is just move yep. forward an inch every day, you know, just move yep. forward on all the things you do, do a little bit every day and you'll be amazed, you know, to go a hundred miles, you got to take the first step or whatever, but after a hundred days of steps or a year or five years or 10 years, you'll find you're in a completely different place. Yeah. Well, and that's, 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 in fact, there's an Arctic, there's a famous, I think that's like the... Antarctic, I think Arctic mission where one group just did the same amount, no matter what the weather was every day went like 19 miles a day. Yep. The yes. other one did like 30 miles on good days and then not on bad days. And the group that just was consistent day in, day out one, and that's sort of a key to life. Yep. And that's the hardest thing in life. It's really hard to just every day, day after day. It, it is hard because the feedback loop isn't as fast as the action cycle. So the feedback you're getting, especially with the world of social media where we expect the results quickly. But I think discipline is something that is so often overlooked as a key foundational principle of success in any field. And the disciplined person is going to be more successful than the explosive person, even if the explosive person has more natural ability. And that is something that I think is uh, disheartening to people who do have natural ability and up to a certain point have been able to succeed by going in furious bursts will find that those who keep going, even if they're not as talented, as good looking, they didn't start off as rich or whatever, they just keep plowing through, man. And obviously you have to have a good strategy and a good trajectory. But it works. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay. The next one we're going to do completely on mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> like Joe Rogan yeah. and uh, Post Malone. They did their. Uh, did they do what on Did they do what they on, ate on mushrooms? Some mushrooms and then did a podcast? Oh my gosh. That's the. Yeah, that's the, We'll have to do that one in person. Um, we'll do that with we'll the next one in the studio. So, much love. Do you have any where people can find you? Or are you just on the. You're just on the uh, interwebs. You know, Where are you? I. 
um, have a anonymous Twitter. <laughs> I think you know. It. Um, okay. I don't okay. Into. Fair enough. Uh, but um, my LinkedIn page is the best for uh, Stephen Kawaja on LinkedIn. I'll put it in the show. That's where, and I write some random articles and do some, you know. Uh, one I'm most proud of is in February of 2020, I wrote about the coming COVID. So you can find some cool stuff there on LinkedIn. Should I link to your SoundCloud? Too? <laughs> you can, if you want. <laughs> I'm on Spotify too, but the, you can hear that. Go, go dig around and look at and look at what Steven's doing. I'll put this in the intro. The reason why I chose Steven is because of how <laughs> eclectic he is. He has a very high level of business acumen. He has a very uh, well-rounded creative sense, and he likes rap yeah. as much as and I, I do. And I like so to rap. You. I'm not uh, as good as I'd like thank to be, you so but much. I love rap. So. <laughs> it's an evolving skill set, sir. We're yes, always getting better. better. Much okay. love. Hit All you guys right, on the flip brother. side.